I will read those Proverbs and then I will give you what I uh, think that they are teaching or at least the way I'm going to present them with what I think they are teaching. So beginning in verse 19, we have a better than proverb. Uh, I want you to notice the word dwell. It's repeated twice, so we see something that occurs twice, particularly in a very short, pithy sentence. We want to take note of it. So, better to dwell in a desert land than to dwell with a contentious and vexing wife. 20. A desirable supply of food and oil are in, here's our word again, dwell or dwelling place of the wise, but the fool gulps his down. 21. The man who pursues righteousness and kindness, right, of course, is the covenant word, covenant loyalty for Hesed. The man who pursues righteousness and kindness will find life, prosperity, and honor. 22. The wise scale the city walls of warriors. And now this and is really doesn't combine the two sentences. It's very unique in the proverb. And we'll talk about that. Um, and pulls down its strong security. Now the word security, you may have uh, trust in your translation. The King James has confidence. It's the idea of security. And we'll get into that. And here is 23. He who guards his mouth and tongue is one who guards his life from distress. A proverb regarding communication. All right, here's the way I think these proverbs are, or what they mean and the way I'm going to teach them. Verse 19, the contentious wife is worse than the outdoor elements. The contentious wife is worse than the outdoor elements. 20. Instant gratification is the way of a fool. Instant gratification is the way of a fool. 21. The Believer's life of righteousness and covenant loyalty. The believer's life of righteousness and covenant loyalty. Again, that's hesed, that's kindness. There's 28 ways to translate the word. Covenant loyalty is the one that I use. But the elevated life, the believer's life, of righteousness and covenant loyalty, you will find or you will be found. You will find or you will be found. Here's 22. Courage, the courageous believer, follows their training. The courageous believer follows their training and win great victories. The courageous believer follows their training and wins great victories. The 22nd proverb there is one you really have to meditate on. There is a lot in a little there. Here's 23. Careful with words because the pain they can bring back to you. Careful with words 
because the pain they can bring back to you. Okay, here we go with our exposition. Proverbs 21, beginning in verse 19. I really feel like I need to give almost a caveat before I begin this proverb, because uh, as a student, Dr. Johnson would say to us, you know, anyone can quote Scripture. He was referring to the fact that that's exactly what Satan did. He quoted the Scripture to the Lord. But he pointed out as well that it's really the student of the Word of God that can answer that quotation back with another verse of Scripture, which is exactly what our Lord did in the temptation in the wilderness. So as we look at this proverb, uh, 2119, let's answer it back with this, thinking of the full counsel of God as it's instructed to us in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 18.22, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Keep that in mind. Now, here's our better than proverb. 21.19, better to dwell in a desert land than dwell with a contentious and vexing wife. It is the father and mother, remember, in the home that are counseling, teaching, instructing the son. That's basic groundwork of the book of Proverbs. Teaching them the skill for living through life. And here it is. Avoid the contentious woman. She will make a horrible partner in your life. That's the idea. Now, previously, we had this word dwell, and we had it in reference to the corner. That would have been the flat roof of the homes as they were built back in those days in solitary discomfort and danger. That was Proverbs 21.9 that we looked at that. Now, here, I want you to notice that we instantly recognize the same type of context. It's the roof. It's being located there. Only this time we have the word desert land. Now, if you're a student at all of the book of Exodus, you recognize that book, that word instantly. Because desert or wilderness is what the translation is. So what is the desert or wilderness? It's an uncivilized land, uninhabited and uninhabitable. Job chapter 24 in verse 5 uses the word speaking where wild donkeys would be out foraging for food in the wilderness, in a desert land in a place you don't want to be. Well, here is our proverb, line two. It depicts the husband, notice, dwelling, living, staying, being there. That's the idea of the word dwelling, repeated twice. Here it is, Psalm 37, verse three. We remember it, David's words, trust the Lord and do good, Dwell. That means stay and live there. Same word. And enjoy safe pasture. The land of Israel, the promised land, was where the Israelite was to stay. That was his inheritance that was given to him. So here in line two, the husband is exposed. That's the picture that's the proverb depicts for us, he's exposed to the elements of this wilderness, this desolate place. So let's think that through. He's drenched with rain. He's exposed to the hot sun. He has dangerous vermin of all kind that he has to guard himself from. And each day 
His existence must be to find enough food to live. That's the exposure to the elements that this desert land presents. Now, look at your proverb again. It's better than. Referring to those confines than to this vexing woman that you would be married to. Quarreling wife. A horrible way to live. And so that is the, the proverb. It's instruction of the mother and the father to the son to beware. Here's 20. A desirable supply of food and oil. Here's our word again. Dwelling. Where we stay. Where we live. Where we exist. In a locale. In a dwelling place of the wise. And here's your contrast. But the fool gulps his down. Now what's going on here? Well, we open the top line with the righteous in continual abundance. It is offset with a fool's desire for instant gratification. If you think about it, the Proverbs teach a contrast here in this proverb between brevity, that's the fool's way, and endurance, something that is maintained over a period of time. This opening word, desirable, and that's an interesting word. It's found by, uh, uh, given to us by Isaiah the prophet, used to describe the Messiah before He ever came to be. Here it is, His description, Isaiah 53, 12. There was no beauty in Him that we should, and here's your word, desire. He was no Rock Hudson. No, He was just common. And ordinary. We would never have picked him out of a crowd by the way he looked. That's the point of the verse. And the desire is what our feeling would be regarding him. Nothing special at all. So, desire is to take pleasure in. Used in Proverbs 1.22 of mockers, the most hardened of the forum of fools who delight, desire, they're mocking. They love it. Now, here's desire again. Another passage you're familiar with. Genesis 2.9 And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up a tree that was desirable. Genesis 2.9 Pleasant to the sight, good for food. That's your word. And now here, what's desirable? Well, what's desirable in the proverb is a supply of food and oil. Food is literally grain, which in our lesson concerning the ant, Proverb 6, was food all year round. Planted in one season, harvested in another, stored in another. Along with this oil, a reference to olive oil, which is pressed out in its season. So that you have food to live. That's what is desirable among the wise. And that's what's provided, says the proverb. Now... Where? In the dwelling place. It's literally here in the pasture, in the farmland. And why wouldn't it be? Because this is an agrarian economy. Everybody was farmers. So that's what we would see of the ancient Israelite. It'd be, uh, think of people walking around in overalls all day. That's the idea of the Israelite who is living in the land that has been given to him. And so, look what he does. He works it. He plans, and then he works his land. 
He plans His work and He works His plan. Now, that is, my friends, abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 91. That's real Calvinism, if you will. You remember, Calvinism emphasizes the means as well as the ends. It puts both pieces together and you cannot separate them. The sovereignty of God and the providence of God fit hand in glove. Let's just think about it for a moment. The Apostle Paul, he gives us the sovereignty of God. Ephesians chapter 1, we, he said, were chosen before the foundation of the world. His sovereign plan. He goes on in the book of Romans and tells us that we are going to be conformed to the image of Christ Himself. All the providence and sovereignty of God intertwined to make that happen. That's the sovereignty of God, the plan. But the how, how that actually comes about, that's providence. Here's what I mean. The apostle, chosen before the foundation of the world, he said, that was me. But how? Well, how was the Damascus Road? It was on my way down the Damascus Road, going to persecute those Christians. I am Saul of Tarsus. I am a Pharisee of the Pharisees. That's the how. And guess what happened? God arrested him on his way. That's the providence of the sovereignty of God. And that's how they fit together. You cannot separate them. So, here is the wise man. He plans his work and he works his plan. All under the sovereignty and providence of God. Line two. Here's our contrast. The contrast to that activity is the fool. And here is the fool's way. He gulps it down. The idea, says the lexicon, is it's the practice of a greedy habit. He's only interested in the moment. Now, here's your illustration. The best illustrations are always from the Scriptures. Genesis 25. It's Esau. He, Jacob is cooking his stew. Esau comes in from the field. I love Donald Gray Barnhouse. What a great preacher. And Barnhouse described it as here comes Esau smelling like a deer and tracking mud all through the house. Now that's... Vivid preaching. That was Barnhouse. And here's Jacob. He's cooking this stew. And Esau said, I'm starving. I want that stew. Give me some of that. A bowl, two bowls, five bowls, who knows. But Jacob has his eye on the prize. And so he says, well, I want your birthright. And what does uh, Esau do? Birthright doesn't do him any good. Doesn't mean anything to me, he says. So he gets his stew and he woofs it down. Who knows how many bowls, but he woofs it down. And off he goes, never giving it a second thought whatsoever. That is the way of wickedness. Right there. It's what I want at the moment. The aspect of the wicked life is given to us again by the writer to the epistle to the Hebrews regarding Esau. He, he has three wives. That's his immorality, said the writer to the epistle to the Hebrews. He has two Hittite wives and an Ishmaelite wife. He had Canaanite wives, which were a prohibition against uh, given by Abraham in the family. He didn't care. And so, that's his life. That's his way. 
instant gratification. Give me what I want when I want it. Welcome to the world. That's the way they think. That is the fool processing life, gulping it down from their greedy thoughts, displaying a lack of reflection and any form of restraint whatsoever, never caring about consequences, never thinking life through at all. Samson, Judges chapter 14, verse 1. First recorded words of the mighty man Samson in the Bible. I saw a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as a wife. No thought. No reflection. No. It's just what I want, when I want it, gulping life down, and now I'm off to the next thing. That's the fool. And that's the fool's behavior. That's his way. That's the way he lives. Life is all about me. And thus, his destiny. Well, what does Paul say? His God is his belly. It's his appetites. And he's headed for destruction. And that's the way you can identify him. I want my happiness, I want it now, and I don't care about any consequences associated with it. Here's 21. The man who pursues righteousness and covenant faithfulness. Our top line, we instantly recognize, of course, this word hesed, covenant loyalty translated here as kindness. What's interesting, it is connected to righteousness. That's striking because the Proverbs normally connect it to justice. But here it's with righteousness. And the Proverbs says, living that way will bear material benefits to you real material benefits on this earth, in the here and now. And this is really the constant theme of the Proverbs themselves. Chapter 3 and verse 1, My son, do not forget your teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For here, the, the physical benefits of doing that. Length of days, said the mother, mother and father. Years to your life, they say. And peace, peace will be added to you. Now let's remember, manna came from above. Didn't work for it. Didn't plant it. Didn't plow it. Didn't water it. It came from above. And what does the Apostle tell us in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2? Set your minds above. In heavenly places. That's where we ought to be thinking. Where do our blessings come from? They come from above. Now notice in line one. They come to the wise who chase, pursue, run after. Goodness, mercy, covenant loyalty, righteousness. We've studied this term before, Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 19. Whoever is steadfast in righteousness will live. Whoever chases, whoever pursues evil, he'll die. The lexicon translates this chasing and pursuing as to follow after. And you remember David's words, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. It's the idea of a dog on your heel. Can't shake him free. He's there. He's with you at all times. And I think this is the point of the writer to the epistle to the Hebrews. Chapter 12. 
since we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin that so easily besets us, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And so what are we to do with life? We're to run it. Run it as it's laid out for us. Now here the proverb says, line one, the object of pursuit is righteousness, covenant loyalty, or kindness. The compassion of us all should be evident every day in our lives. That's the way we conduct our affairs. So there's no such thing as, well, this is business, and this is, uh, this is my life in the church. No, it doesn't work that way. It's not segregated. It is all one. We are all the same people. All the time. Every time. So in the Proverbs, we often have righteousness and justice. That's why this really catches our attention. Just a short time back, Proverbs 21.3, we had righteousness and justice. But now look at this. It's Righteousness and covenant loyalty. Line two, it's an aptitude. It's a way to think about life and my affairs and the way I conduct them. And here's the benefit because we're in the book of consequences. Here are the consequences to living that way. He finds life. Now what does that mean to find life? Well, I'm not going to run over that phrase. I'm going to break it down so that we absolutely know it for certain. What is it to find? To come upon, to meet, to locate, to obtain. A proverb that we just recently studied and just referenced at the beginning of our lesson today, 1822. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. There you are. You understand to find. Come upon to meet, to locate, to obtain. 1 Samuel 30. David was in pursuit of the Amalekites. They had just burned him out at Ziglag. Took all the women and children as hostages. And so David, under the direction of Abiathar and the Urim Thurim, he was in hot pursuit. And we could say he was chasing them. When suddenly he comes upon, he finds a half-dead Egyptian who happened to be with the Amalekite raiding party. Now, what a pleasant surprise that was. He revives him, and that half-dead man being revived led David down to their camp, and David wins a great victory. See, he's chasing righteousness. And look what he finds along the way. It brings him victory. That's what took place. And who couldn't identify if we were been listening to Dan as he's been instructing us in the Gospel of John? Who couldn't identify with the excitement of Andrew going back to Simon, his brother, and saying to him, John 1.41, we found the Messiah. We found Him. The one they've been talking about for centuries. We found Him. So, what is it to find? Well, here's the idea of the proverb. See, you get up every morning and you're just out in the world chasing covenant loyalty, pursuing it whenever you have an opportunity. That's your way. That's your life. It's indelibly stamped upon you. And you're chasing righteousness. What is that in the Proverbs? Disadvantaging yourself to advantage others. I'm thinking about you. And I'm thinking what is best for you 
at all times. There it is. Covenant loyalty and righteousness. When suddenly I find, or suddenly I'm found, the phone rings. You can never make the phone ring. Only God can make the phone ring. And somebody you meet. And they say, oh, I know somebody that you need to meet. And I know something for you to do. And somebody completely out of your sphere walks into your life. And you go, wow. Only God can do that. Only God can bring things like that about. Now, what have you found? Who found you? Why are you here? You may be asking that question about me. Why are you here? I bet you've been asking that for a long time. Well, I'm here because somebody asked me to be here. But the point is, I was passive. They asked me. It's a providence. You live your life with the idea that I am going to pursue righteousness. That's the way I'm going to live my life. I'm going to pursue covenant loyalty. And the world goes, you're an idiot. It's kill or be killed. You been out there on the roads? Boy, I go out there. I drive back to Oklahoma City. I get north of Denton and I go into panic mode because it's you go from this marvelous freeway and all these overpasses from here to Denton, but you get north of Denton, you're in the Wild West because you're down to two lanes and it's loaded and everybody's driving 80 miles an hour and you've got these trucks and everybody is more important to you. So they're going to go around you. They're going to go through you one way or another. And I mean, it takes your breath away. Whoa! That's living my life driving north of Denton. But look, here's the point of the proverb you're going to find. Are you going to be found? Let's think about that for a moment. Here's Joseph in Pharaoh's prison. If you ever study Egyptology, you learn something about Pharaoh's prison. You never get out of Pharaoh's prison. I always ask businessmen this question. What side of the key lock did that key, was it sent in the inside or the out Joseph didn't have a key that lock was open from the outside who opened that lock the providence of God opened that lock if Pharaoh could find Joseph a foreigner in the depths of his darkest dungeon he can certainly find you and me can he certainly can so what do I do? So what should you do? Well, here's your way. You want to be wise? You want to put on the skill for living? Here it is. Let's put it on together. Let's chase righteousness. Disadvantaging ourselves to advantage others. And let's pursue covenant loyalty together. Being faithful. Faithful in every way we can possibly think about. Don't seek life for yourself. That's the fool's way. That's a way of death. That's the way of destruction. Jeremiah 45.5 Do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. You have been brought to faith to minister to other people. That's what you're about. That should be your life. That's the framework of your life. And look what happens 
says the proverb, when you live like that, life. And how's that described for us? Prosperity, tangible results, physical assets, honor, which means to be heavy. Benefits that can only come from Him where our minds are supposed to be all the time in heavenly places. I'm not looking for benefit of a man. I'm looking for the blessing of God. And the pursuit of my life proves it. Look at the way I conduct my affairs. Yeah, I've known many prosperous, Wealthy men of the world. And I can tell you, 2022, they have, they have no assets today. They're sold out and worthless from a financial aspect. And along the way, here was their lifestyle. They didn't count their name better than silver and gold. No, they did the opposite. They counted silver and gold as better than their name. And their name is worthless today because of the way they lived. They have lost their honor, whatever honor that they had. You want an example? How about Lot? Remember Lot? Nephew of Abram sought the bright lights. Down in Sodom. Go make a name for myself. Go become famous. So he pitches his tents toward. Then he's living in. And then we find him at the city gate. So he is making decisions for the community. That's a lot. And what happened to him? Well, he gave up faithfulness a long time ago. And what happened to him? He lost everything. At the end of his life, where do we find him? What's the snapshot? In immorality with his own daughters. In a cave. In a desolate cave at Zoar. Now God repeats that story over and over and over again so that you and I can see it. Mark it well. Here is the way to find and to be found righteousness, covenant faithfulness. Chase it, pursue it, make it the habit of your life. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, make no provision for the flesh, and run for goodness and mercy. That's the proverb. Here's 22. The wise scale the city walls of warriors and pull down its strong security. In the previous proverb, the wise were to practice daily righteousness and covenant faithfulness to find life, physical prosperity, and honor. But now here in this proverb, the wise is depicted as a formidable warrior. Isn't that interesting? In a world of evil and wicked men. So line one, look at these parallels. To scale literally means to go up. Line two, to pull down. In contrast, both parallels underscore the seeming impossible achievement of the wise here. A world of men, they look on. They don't look on with amusement. They look on rather astounded. How did you do that? They say. I remember the memorial service for Dr. Johnson. Mr. Pryor spoke. And he said when they built Believer's Chapel, Dr. Johnson was a man of certain convictions. We will not pass the plate in a public meeting. That's why we don't pass the plate at the ministry of the Word service. We pass the plate at the meeting of the church only, where believers gather. 
We being among those who attend the public ministry of the Word, which we will go to after this. That was his conviction. Another conviction, that the Word of God is absolutely free. So we will take our lessons, and you know, they're called cassette tapes, and we'll send them out all over the world. And that's what they did. At no cost. No cost. Just order them and they'll be sent. No money required. Because the Gospel, the Word of God is free. Those were his convictions. And Mr. Pryor said, and when people heard that in the Christian community, they said, well, that won't last. You know, that's, that's a good thought, but that's not going to last. It goes on today. Even to this day. Why? Those are your convictions. That's what you believe that the Word of God is teaching here. And so the world looks on and they say, how do you do that? Well, here's how we do it. We all know the answer, don't we? It's in the Bible. It's Zechariah 4.6. This is the Word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. That's how we do it. Robert Murray McShane died as a young man. Great missionary. He gives us a clear word of how we do it. He says, it's not great gift that God blesses, it's great likeness to Jesus Christ. That's the power. That's the the absolute power to get things done. Look, this wisdom, this wise warrior, he puts his training to work with his God-given abilities. And he scales a wall. And in so doing, he takes on face-to-face -face the combat of the protectors of the city. You see, they have all the advantages. You've got to think through this proverb. They have all the advantages. That's the world. That's the system out here. They've got it. They've got the height advantage, easy to defend, pouring down hails of arrows, heavy stones, hot oil, fire logs. But look at line two. You remember I said that word and? It's the marker for a narrative. What does that mean? It means the proverb is actually teaching us a story, telling us chapter one, line one, chapter two, line two. So here it is, a proverb telling us a story. First the attack, line one, and now the subsequent victory, line two. The man of wisdom pulls down cities' formidable walls and towers. They seem from eyesight to be impregnable. Why, you can't do that. Pull down the action, literally cause to go down against that city. It's the picture of deconstruction. Here's the way it's used. Amos chapter 3, verse 11. An enemy will overrun your land. And here's our word, pull down. Pull down your strongholds and plunder your forces. Amos 3.11. Look at this word strong. Stands for formidable security. It is a figure. It's a figure where one word represents several things. It's a figure. If, for example, I were to use the word scepter, what would you think? You would think of a king, you'd think of Pharaoh, you'd think of rule, you'd think of authority. It's the word scepter. It can ha have all of those various meanings. Here it is tied to security. Those walls, they're formidable. The scepter of the wicked won't remain over the house uh, of the land allotted to the righteous. Well, here, security. That's what those walls are for, right? But the righteous, they scale them. They do impossible feats. They use their training, and then they apply energy to it, trusting God. That's how it works. 
and they overcome. That's what a believer is. He overcomes the world. He overcomes the obstacles. That's what he does. It is David facing the giant. And what does he use? He uses the skill that he learned. He used the skill and he trusted God. He released that sling and he trusted God. God would set it on the right path, whatever that path was to be. And if he needed another stone or another or another, he had them. But God directed that first one, and that's all that was needed. My friends, be people of certain convictions and live them out. Pursue righteousness. Pursue covenant faithfulness. Make that the passion of your life. I don't know how many days we have left, but here's what the proverb says. You'll be great overcomers, great achievers, and you'll live prosperous life, valuable life, and have a great testimony among us all. And that's the book of Proverbs. And that is your proverb. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study this morning. Thank you for these people that rise up to hear the Word of God. And we are so grateful for them. And Lord, over the years, they just keep coming. They find us or we find them. But we remain the same. We teach righteousness here. We practice covenant faithfulness. And as a result, look what you have done. Look at all that you've accomplished. Look at our elders today. Look at our deacons. Look at the work that goes on in this place. It's all in the Proverbs, Lord. We are the overcomers of the world. For you, for your glory, and for your lasting testimony in the land today. In Jesus' name, amen.